This is the Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. Welcome to the Wealth Ability Show, where we're always discovering how to make way more money and pay way less taxes. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, your host, founder, and CEO of Wealth Ability. So a year ago, unemployment in the U.S. was right around 10%. Today, it's hovering around 6%. What we've learned, I think, during the pandemic is that being an employee is one of the riskiest ways to make money. So today, we're going to discover how to still be an employee if we want to be an employee and invest part-time so that we can reduce the risk of employment. And uh, with me today is my new friend, Steve Rosenberg. Uh, Steve, great to have you on the show. I appreciate you having me, Tom. Thank you very much. So Steve is a full-time airline pilot and uh, a part-time investor. And I thought it'd be great to have uh, somebody real who's actually doing this on the show. So Steve, what made you get into investing in the first place? Uh, clearly, you still like your job. So what got you into investing right off the bat? Yeah, that's a good question. So what, what, precipitated me to get out of the realm of just being a employee was uh, 9-11. So it was, it was a tragedy that happened. We all remember 2001. And that was the day that I realized that my safe, secure job as an airline pilot was not safe. And it was not secure because 48 hours after the towers fell, I got delivered a furlough notice that basically said, hey, Steve, thanks for being a great employee, but we don't think we need you. And you're about to be on the street with 50,000 other pilots. So good luck. And so that to me was, that's when my should became a must. And I realized that I needed to figure out another strategy very, very quickly. So it wasn't necessarily a choice, but uh, it, it was something that I had to do. Well, I, I think this, you, you make the point exactly, is that we never know when something's going to happen that's outside of our control. I, I remember when I was, uh, the, the job I had as the in-house tax advisor for a Fortune 1000 company, my first responsibility was to let half of my people go. Wow. <laughs> Literally half of them, and it was just a downside. It had nothing to do with their competence, had nothing to do with their abilities. It simply, I was told, cut your staff in half. And, uh, and, and that's when I realized that having a single client or a single customer is really risky business. So I, I love the idea that you're still, you're back being an airline pilot. There's lots of demand right now. Um, obviously there wasn't even a year ago, but there is right now uh, based on the times I've been on a plane recently. So you want to be, so you like being um, a full-time airline pilot, um, but how do you even start with the idea of becoming a part-time investor? Now, I get it. As an airline pilot, you, you know, you've got days on, days off, but let's take about take a busy surgeon or somebody who is working 50, 60 hours a week. How do you even start? Where do you even start with a part-time investing? Well, for me, it started by reading and educating myself because being, I was 25 years old when I got hired with my first airline. That's all I ever wanted to do was to have a job as an airline pilot, probably like someone else that they have a specialty in their field. And it was very quickly uh, came to my attention uh, that the skill set I had was only valuable in an airplane. So I realized that I could not even drive a truck because I didn't have the qualifications. And so I started looking to see what is it that other people do that are successful? Like I had no idea. And everything was somehow tied to real estate. At one form or another, books I read, and you know, I did the Rich Dad, Poor Dad and the whole series and everything. And I just, I thought, okay, this resonates with me. And it wasn't really the fact that I could do it part-time. It was a matter of understanding the value of leverage and being understanding the difference, the fulcrum point of being an employee and, you know, being at now in a furlough line with 50,000 other pilots or understanding that I can control my destiny. And while well, I said, I never talk about that just for a yeah. second. Let, let's talk about controlling your destiny because I actually think that's a big deal right now. We have uh, the U S government who frankly wants to control everybody's lives. Yeah. Um, it, it appears right there. They want more, more entitlements, more people on more benefits. Um, and that's going on all over the world. Right. I mean, you see in France, yeah. 
Uh, they're requiring vaccine cards to get a cup, cup of coffee. So there's a lot of other forces trying to control us. Why would you want to be in control of yourself? That's, it's a big theme of ours at WealthAbility is you know your ability to create wealth and being in control of your destiny. But why was that so important to you? You know, there was a, everybody has a defining moment in their life. And I'll tell you a personal one of mine. Um, I remember the days after 9-11, I'd already been given my pink slip and I was basically waiting for my exit um, from the airline. And if you remember during the time frame of 9-11 at the actual happening of it, all the aircraft, wherever they were in the world, had to circle and land where they were. So they dispatched all the flight crews around the world to pick up these airplanes and reposition them. And I will, I will never forget this. And again, this is one of those moments that I have. It gives me the chills thinking about it. But I remember walking through, I believe it was Denver Airport at the time. And if you've ever walked through a terminal, airport terminal with no life, there's no existence of everybody. It's a very huge, cavernous, eerie building. And I remember looking outside at the tarmac and seeing all these aircraft parked in a jigsaw puzzle because they were just trying to fit them somewhere on the, air, on the airport. And I remember looking out and thinking to myself, my life as I know it will never be the same again. I didn't do anything to cause this, but I am, a, I am basically going to be affected for many, many years to come. And the, and the thing that bothered me is I knew that I put myself in that position by being lazy and I believed in an illusion that a safe, secure job would support me. Now at the time, many, many people did, but it was that was my moment that I realized that I did this to myself. And that's the victim, victor mentality. And, I, and sure, there's many pilots I know that at that moment, they just said, well, that's just the, that's the way it is. I took bold steps into a very unknown charted territory called real estate. I didn't know what I was doing. Like many people, I made a lot of mistakes. I was very successful. I ended up you know, learning, getting educated, getting trained and mentored. And 20 years from now, so it's a cycle. If you look today at 20 years, you look at a lot of the people in the airline industry, maybe a year ago, the same people that I knew back then that were afraid of losing their jobs are still afraid of losing their jobs. You look at me and I say, you know what? I'm okay. If the airline goes out of business, I'm okay because I took massive action into unknown scary waters, but I did it because I, I vowed to myself that day, I would never ever put myself in that position that I was in that terminal building looking out at those airplanes. Well, I, I think you make a really good point that, you know, it's, it's taking control of our own lives. Um, I, I had a similar situation um, when I, um, <laughs> I left a big CPA firm, um, not at, on my choice, okay? Um, they brought somebody else in, they liked them better. And uh, I decided to start my own CPA firm. I, I, instead of taking the real estate route, I took the business route. And I just decided after a year, and I was not making very much money after a year, I'm going, I don't care. I remember telling my wife this, I don't care if we make $30,000 a year, if I make $30,000 a year for the rest of my life, I am never going back to work for somebody else. So part of that is that I like I'm the youngest of six children. I like being in control because um, I grew up not being, I had so many people telling me what to do. But part of it also is I'm going, the risk, oh my heavens, the, the risk of these, un, the, these, these consequences that we don't know that they're going to happen. I mean, who knew we were going to get COVID, right? Who knew that we were going to get 9-11? You may just not know that when your, your business may decide to shut down or, or sell out or there's so many things outside of our control that getting something inside of our control, like investing, uh, can have a huge impact. So you started with the education, you started getting to understand, which I think is the key because it's like, it's like um, uh, professional traders, stock market traders, you wanna trade paper first before you actually do the real thing because a lot of people learned in 2005, six and seven that uh, if you go into real estate without practicing and getting the education, you can get hammered again, maybe no fault of yours, maybe something completely outside of your control like the collapse in 2008 and nine. But at the same time, it's that education that gets you started. So what kind of education um, for you was, what, what was the biggest thing that kind of, um, you know, turned the corner for you and said, okay, now I'm ready? Yeah, that's a great question. For me, it was understanding that, and this may sound not, not very intelligent, but it was me understanding that I didn't know what I needed to know. It was understanding that I didn't understand that 
having a goal and having an end destination of what I wanted to accomplish. We do it all the time. We get in our car, we have an end destination. I get in an airplane. I know where I'm going. I have an end destination. I started buying real estate. I had no end destination. I was buying deals because other people told me they were good deals. I never factored them into data and numbers. And I didn't have a reason I was buying them. And of course, real estate has a way, sometimes it's a lot slower, but it has a way of showing you that you've made a mistake. And when that wrecking ball comes back the other way, as we all know, it does not discriminate and it does not partial anyone from the wreck that's coming. And I was one of those people and I learned my lesson. Um, And the, the biggest moment for me personally was understanding that I had to, I had to be around smarter people. I had to learn to associate with people that were where I wanted to go. To me, that was getting coached, getting mentored. Uh, I was coached and mentored for at least the last 10 years. I still do it today. And I'm just a big believer of realizing that every day, you know, you're like a tree, you're either growing or you're dying. And, And every day you have a decision that you can either grow or you can die every single day we wake up. And I've learned that the only way of doing that is having that end, that North star, that end destination and having that why that just is relentless that you are going to get to it. And so for me, that that's what it was for me. And it may sound simple. It wasn't this big prolific thing. It was just understanding that I needed a destination and I didn't have one. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, investing in anything, whether it's real estate, stocks, business, et cetera, is um, it's hard work. I mean, even if it's yes. part time, it's hard work. And having a reason to do it is not just a, a target, but it's actually a reason for doing it. Right. So that you're not just saying, oh, I just want to make some more money, but it's actually, wow, what if, you know, in the next five years or seven years or 10 years, what if I didn't have to work? Okay. What if I could have my dream car, my dream vacation, my dream house, whatever that dream is? Um, that's why at, at Wealth Billy, actually, see, we actually start with your dream. We always start with your dream um, because that's the why right? What is the why there? And it also allows us to quantify, okay, well, if that's true, if that's your dream, what's the cost of that dream? Because people may say, we hear people say, oh, money's not important. Well, that's, we all know that's baloney, right? Um, right. You and I do, because <laughs> everything you, <laughs> things you want, they cost money. Even if it means time and freedom, that costs money. So what we, what we have to start with is we have to go, okay, where are, where are we going? Where are we today? And let's make a plan um, to get there. And, and let's get a, uh, a plan together to get there. So when you were doing that, undertaking that, those initial steps where you practiced a little bit, had some failures, which is a great way to learn. Mistakes are the best sure. way to learn. Um, when, once you've done that, but you, now you've got your why, how did you go about creating your plan? You know, it's funny, I, I, at the time, in the flying world, we call it building the plane in the air as we're flying it. Uh, and that was, very, that was very similar to our business model. As we evolved, it kept stacking. We didn't know where it was going to go. We ended up building a very large property management company in the interim and ended up selling that business and exiting um, that company. Uh, but what I learned was that, you know, it... it it's a, and I, I go back to the same basic foundation. It's a matter of the lifestyle that you want to have. And so w- people buying houses, it's not four walls and a roof. That is not going to make you happy. And it's definitely not going to make you successful. It's the business model that runs inside of that four walls and the roof. And that business model is dictated by numbers and data. So you could say, I want to have the lifestyle, the flexibility, the freedom, but you have to quantify that. And you've got to put some numbers and data to it. So just like you said, you, and that took me a while, to be honest, it took me a while to understand that. And I don't think of myself as an ignorant person. I'm an airline pilot. I do pretty well, but it was just something that they don't teach us that in school. As we know, there's no manual that says, Hey, Steve Rosenberg, here is your book of life of all the things as an airline pilot, investor, business owner, coach, speaker, this is your life, Steve. And here's the manual you have to follow. We don't get that. So we have to figure it out on our own. And for me, it was one of those things that we just kept stacking it and stacking it. And and luckily, I would say the only reason that I I feel that I was successful is I took massive action on a daily basis. The naysayers, all the people, I just kept getting up every day. As all of us do, we would get knocked down. I would get lied to, stolen from, all those things. 
but it didn't phase me. It didn't bother me because I knew I had nothing behind me because I was about to lose my job. So I, I had to keep looking forward and I had to keep getting up and I just did not let anything stop me. And I think one of the biggest challenges with entrepreneurs is we, 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 we maybe get our toe banged and we say, well, I'm going back because that was no fun that you're, you're missing the reason why you're doing it. And, and just like you said, if you don't have that, why motivation is a battery, it drains over time. And if you have that, why that's, what's going to carry you through. So it was, I, I wish I could say it was this, this light in the sky defining moment, but it was just something that built over time of getting coached and mentored and understanding what is my perfect life? What, what do I, what does Steve Rosenberg want for his family and for his life? And, and for everyone, it's different. And so for me, I, I can't say it was a defining moment. It was more of a evolution of things over time. Got it. So, so I, I've uh, learned over years as I've seen a lot of successful <laughs> and failed um, business owners and investors uh, that people, we, we tend to start with a single, a certain why, and that is I want to accomplish X. And then what happens is, you know, it's like Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, right? Then we get to a higher, a higher purpose, right? Well, now I want to create a difference. Uh, so for example, I have a, a, a good friend in Austin, a big real estate developer, and they start, he started out just take, working with his dad on uh, residential real estate and multifamily homes. But then what he decided was, I want to make a difference in the neighborhood. I want to, and now they have award-winning neighborhoods. They actually are constantly getting awards from the different cities where they go in and, and they take over three or four different development projects and make a why there. So I think there's a, a point here where we, we start with our initial why, and then maybe our why gets bigger and we actually get a bigger purpose. And I think that's where, um, you know, we can expand ourselves and perhaps even go back to what you were talking about, where that's where having a coach or a mentor, somebody who's really driving us can help us expand, you know, so we can do so much more. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny you say that. I think a lot of us, when we get started in a new entrepreneurial endeavor, um, we're running away from what we don't want in life. And so whenever I've coached people or mentored them, I'll say, what, what do you want? What is real estate going to give you? And they'll go on a, maybe a five minute tirade of telling me, I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want a job. I don't want this. And they're telling me all the things they don't want. And I'll listen to them. And when they're done, I'll say, okay, that wasn't my question. My question was, what do you want? And, you know, many times they'll sit there and say, you know what? I don't know. I've never thought about that. I've been so angry at what I don't want in life, I've never really thought about what I want. And I'm like, well, you're going to get exactly what you don't want because that's what you're focused on. And, and they, they sit there, you know, it's the people that always have bad luck, right? They always have bad luck because that's their, their filter. And that's what they're aiming towards. And so a lot of times, again, we evolve. And over time you start saying, okay, I know I, I feel safe with what I don't want now. And now I got to start going and maybe it's an evolution, the second half of our life. Um, I, I'm a big believer in giving back and helping as many people as I can. I don't, I don't do it for money. Don't get me wrong. Money's great. We buy a lot of great things. But once we get our primal needs, I, I had one of my coaches, uh, uh, he became a business partner of ours. Brad Sugar's his name. He, we sat down one day and he said, you know, Steve, he said, after you buy all the cool things in life, all the toys, everything, he said, start buying memories. He said, buy a concert in Wembley Stadium, buy Sunset on the Mediterranean in Greece. He said, buy the memories that the money gives you. Because he goes, you're just going to replace all the toys that you buy. And he said, I have a, a book of all the things I want to enjoy in my life. And these are all memories. And I thought, that's an interesting way to live. And I, and I do that now. I, I have a book and I write down the things that I would like to see, whether with my family, by myself, whatever it is, sunrise over Mount Fuji, whatever it is. I, these are things that I would like to experience. And that's not something money can buy. No, I, I, I like that. So... Uh, let's let's go back to that mentor um, coach thing. You you, you know sure. you're talking about you're talking about you're starting to get specific. You're starting to get your your data together. You're starting to get that. How did you actually? Um, how did you or, or who helped you define what you were going to do in your investing? Because I, I always found that the most focused investors and the most successful investors, right? A niche will make you rich. How did you, uh, was there somebody who helped you do that? How did you actually get that narrowed focus so that you could be ultra successful in what you were wanting to do? That's a good question. And, and I would have to say it wasn't, it wasn't a one person. It was, it, it had evolved for the things that I wanted in my life. But I will, I will tell you, 
the biggest success I had, believe it or not, was from my business coaches, not real estate coaches, mm -hmm. because I learned that it, whether you own a piece of real estate or you own a business or you own ownership and they're all run under the same chassis. And, you know, you have marketing, you have sales, you have operations, you have finance, IT, maybe HR. But if you don't understand those, at least the first four, the, the marketing, sales, operations, and finance, if you don't understand that, you're not going to have a successful rental property portfolio. You're not going to be able to advise people on a business. It, it goes on and on. That is the chassis that all, as, as you well know, that's the chassis that everything runs off of. At Real least that's the way I was taught. Real estate is a business. And it doesn't matter exactly it's a business. And when you approach it as a business, it, it's a it's a whole different matter um, when you invest as business. So eventually you had to come up with a team. Um, yes. I presume you don't do this all by yourself. Uh, never met a successful entrepreneur who did everything by themselves. Uh, I think that's actually the the I say the three most expensive words in the English language are do it yourself. Um, yes, very the true. worst saying ever is if I want it done right, I have to do it myself. I, I've learned, um, I'm old enough to know that if I want it done right, I need to find the person who can do it better than I could do it. Um, yep. But how, uh, how have you gone about building your team? Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan and a huge believer in leverage. And so what I do and the way I was taught is the first thing I had to do is I had to figure out what am I not good at? I want, to, I want to focus on my strengths and I want to delegate my weaknesses. So I learned very early on everything that I'm either, it's a low, low level, low enjoyment task or something that's, I'm not skilled taxes. That is not something, could I do it? Maybe I could, but is that the best use of my time? I would say probably not. So I started learning how to delegate my time because you, I, everybody, we have 24 hours in a day, no more, no less how we utilize that time. And again, I'll go back to, to one of my coaches. We were sitting there one time and I was, he, he was on the board of 11 businesses and we were having lunch. And I said, how do you do this? I had one business and it was driving me crazy. And I said, how, how do you do this? And he said, it's a matter of saying no. He said, you have to say no more. And so we went on through this conversation and he said, you know, basically it's a matter of, of putting on blinders and being more focused. He's like, you say yes to everything, but you're really saying no to many more things. You just don't see them. And I said, well, that's easy for you. You know, you're this multimillionaire. You've got these businesses. And he said, you don't understand. I was never going to be this way until I started saying no. And that was kind of the moment that I thought, wow, that was that aha moment I had. And he said, until you start saying no, there's an opportunity cost for everything you do. So I started realizing, and what we started doing with our, with our property management company, which is a very time-intensive, employee-centric operation, because we're not selling a widget, we're selling services, we learned how to get very specific and how to outsource and leverage right person, right seat with our business to where we were able to bring our, our payroll costs down from 60% to 33%, which as you know, is a, is a, is a hard feat to do in a, a, a employee-centric operation because we started to understand the value of leverage and systemization, automation, um, and policies, procedures. And because of that, we were able to scale so much faster because we laid the groundwork in the funneling. And it was really that moment of him, again, maybe it was right time, right moment, I don't know. And we were sitting there and he said, Steve, that's why your phone has rang 11 times and mine hasn't rang once during lunch. And I, and it was just, it was, it was like all of a sudden it just, everything came into focus. I need to say no more. And he said, the problem is when people want to be successful, they think they need to do more. They want to pile everything on their plate. He said, when you look at successful people, we clear our plate and we allow what we want on the plate. You're doing it backwards. And, and again, it was just, that was that moment that I realized, okay, this is what I need to know. And I need to say no to everything and then be selective with what I say yes to. You know, there's a, there's a great quote from Warren Buffett that uh, he became a millionaire saying yes and became a billionaire saying no. Yes. Uh, and uh, that is, a, it's a hard thing to do. And, and I think once we realize that every time we say yes to one thing, we're saying no to something else, uh, we are always making that decision. So let me ask you a question, just to get everybody uh, on, on board here. How much time do you spend investing right now? Oh, my, my investment time is very minimal. Um, I, I have, again, I, I do have a team. Um, I believe in being surrounded by smarter people than myself. I would say when I'm looking at my data and my numbers, I'm probably doing maybe one to two hours a week um, of my investment strategy because I'm a big believer in having stuff brought to me 
Um, it's kind of like pulling a string or pushing it. I like to pull the string and I like stuff to data, data that I need to know, KPIs and metrics that I need to see that will allow me to make a decision. As we all know, real estate is not a fast moving um, project. I got to tell you, it's, it's great, Steve, hearing uh, a, an airline pilot talk about KPIs and metrics. Um, yeah. That's not something you often hear from an airline pilot. Uh, they're more, more talking about uh, uh, you know, speed and elevation, et cetera. Um, but it, so let's kind of wrap this up. And if you could, what would you say would be the top three things that somebody can do if they want to not necessarily replace their job, but maybe not have to work? So have enough passive income, eventually passive income. Um, uh, obviously, it takes work to get there. But what are the top three things? You, you're always talking about action. What are the top three actions you think people ought to take? Yeah. And, and let me just, if it's okay, if I could just say one thing. A lot of people ask me, they'll say, Steve, why don't you quit your job? Why do you keep being a pilot, speaking around the world, owning real estate? Why do you do all this? And my question back to them is, is why do you not? Where is it written that I have to quit my job because I'm successful? If I love what I do, why can't I keep doing it? So my, my advice to people is if you love what you do, don't think that you have to quit your job. If you're not happy or with those things, I get it. But going back to your question, I would say the top three things is number one, you've got to have that end destination. It, it, it has to happen. Once you know your end destination, you have to create the strategy to get you there. It's kind of like if you want to go to Disneyland, you have to realize what freeways are going to get you to Disneyland. That's number two. And number three, uh, you have to take action. You have to walk out the door and get in your car to get there. It's never going to happen on the couch. And the biggest challenge is people talk themselves in and out of success every day because of what they think, as opposed to just taking action. Now, I don't like taking blind action. I think focused and intentional action. So you got to start with the end in mind. You always, just as you said, you've always got to start with the goal. You've got to create the strategy or the roadmap to reach that goal. And then you've got to get off the couch and take action. If you do those three things, 20 years from now, you'll be like me and say, you know what? I don't know how it happened, but it happened by taking action. And I mean, I, I know how it happened now, but at the time I was just taking action. I was doing what I was told. Um, if I could add a fourth, I would say surround yourself with mentors and coaches. That, that, that is the key. I would not be where I was had I not surrounded myself with people that could show me the path. You know, what's, what's interesting, uh, Steve, is that you've really just illustrated the pattern that we actually use with every single client um, because that's what we're teaching. Uh, there's a pattern to this. You start with the end in mind. You then create a plan of action, a strategy for getting there. Then you, um, you've got to take the actual action. You've got to implement that plan of action and you've got to surround yourself with a great team, which... Uh, Again, with a great team, then you can build the processes, uh, like you say, the policies, procedures, all, all of the systems that you need so that you don't have to be there all the time. The good news is, is that on top of, you know, having the freedom that you clearly have, Steve, is that um, I, I would suspect or I would hope that um, you've got a good tax team around you and therefore you don't you have freedom from taxes as well so there's all sorts of freedoms we get um the the key is that once we get educated we have a choice okay and the choice is do we take action or do we not um, but until we get educated we have no choice at all and uh, some of us are forced into it. You were, Steve. I was, I was pushed into it, you know, by, by losing a, a position. Um, some of us take action uh, even when we, you know, we don't have it forced upon us. And uh, with, however it's going to happen, I would encourage everybody, take control of your life. It is, it is your ability to create wealth um, that we're talking about because it's not that hard. Okay, this is the great thing. Anybody can do it, even an airline pilot. Now, I'm just, I'm just kidding, Steve. But no, you're right. You're right. Seriously, no, you're right. Anybody can do this. This that, that there are fundamental principles. What Steve's described is a pattern that we seen work over and over and over again. And when you follow that pattern, when you get that great team around you, you're always going to make way more money and pay way less taxes. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Steve. Bye bye. You've been listening to The Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.